Hello, everyone. Steve Westman, Audiothal Roundtable. Welcome. Today, I have my guest, Nathan Goss. How are you, Nathan? I'm doing well. How about you? Really good. So we're going to do some Atlantic 75 and Rhino Hi-Fi reviews. I'm excited about that. But first, but first, but first, I have to show everyone. I This is the shirt that I wore yesterday, okay? And what happened? The Packers, 48-32 over the Cowboys. I think I'm good luck. I want to, you know, so we have a game that's going on today at 1.30, Buffalo versus Pittsburgh. Um, I got to show everyone this. So I'm going to put you full screen here. So... Go for it. What do you think of that game? Oh, I think uh, I think they should have played yesterday whenever the conditions were even crazier. But I think there's still a lot of snow on the ground and a lot of, uh, you know, cold and stuff. I mean, the whole East Coast is pretty much there. It is frozen. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I'm not a huge football guy. I just like the playoffs. I really like the drama involved. So, yeah, I, I picked up the Green Bay Packers tee on Saturday along with this one. Like they're like 10 bucks or whatever. So. You know, yeah, I'm three for three. I wore a Michigan Michigan Wolverine shirt last week during the game, and they won. They won. Green Bay won yesterday, and we'll see if Buffalo wins today. So there you go. That's my uh, my you know my football uh, you know, my football fanboy in for the day. <laughs> um, cold in Vancouver. We're 31 Fahrenheit right now, which is zero Celsius, which is freezing. Um, but hopefully, it gets a little bit warmer. Though we're expecting snow, so I'm like, oh my god. So it's good. It's good to be inside and listen to records. I mean, that's how that's how I see things, right? Yeah, I think my I think my um, my time per day increases considerably in the colder months. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the thing. Summertime, obviously, less time playing records. Wintertime, from Jan for me, from like January till probably April, when it's well, I mean, Vancouver's not as bad to be outside. We like to get outside a lot as a family, but definitely January through to March. I'm mm -hmm. inside more, able to have some time to listen to records. So, yeah, um, and it's dark. It's dark at like five o'clock. Yeah, like exactly. Exactly. Yeah. No, exactly. So I know you like this. I know a lot of people are. I've gotten a lot of um, comments on this. We have. I have this. I have this segment, and you know this one. You've been on the show before. It's the things that make you go. Hmm. 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 I have yeah. one. Yeah. I have a new one. I always have a new one. So. Um, <clears throat> I was seven years old back in back on August the first, nineteen eighty one. I'm not sure where any, if anyone knows where they were on August first, nineteen eighty one, but that is when MTV came mm. on the airways. Mm -hmm. So today's things that make you go hmm is this: what song and band was the first video that was aired or played on MTV? Was it uh, the video killed the radio star? There it is, the Buggles, the Age of Plastic album. The, the song was the video that killed the radio star. Nice. It was an, and the album came out in 1979 and UK band and yeah, it was a big hit back in '79. Yeah. So it was the first video ever that MTV aired back in August 1st, 1991. So there you go. Mm. You got it. I'm impressed. Well, the t the two videos that I pr pr uh, predominantly remember from that period was Van Halen's "Jump." Yep, that was like that was one of my favorites, and then um, uh, the Cars. You might think. Absolutely, I remember. For me, "Hot for Teacher" was a big mm. one when you're a young kid. That was probably early later on, right? That was 1984, right? Um, I think that was the '84 album. Yep. Mid eighties. That yeah. that was big, uh, and of course, Dire Straits. I want my MTV TV mm. was a big one, and really like that song. And then, of course, that's nineteen eighty five was really when we saw vinyl sort of shift down and CD sales go up. And the big and one of the big reasons why, if anyone actually wants to know, or they're going to know anyways, is because uh, Dire Straits, their Brothers in Arms CD, was actually promoted with Philips Electronics when they were trying to promote the CD player back in 85. So for there was, I think, Dire Straits Brothers in Arms was a million CDs sold in that year right out of the gate. And one of the reasons why, because if you bought a Philips CD player, you got a free Brothers in Arms CD. So that mm -hmm. what really started. If anyone wants <laughs> to know, you know, what happened to vinyl records, you can blame you can blame Dire Straits because that's how it all started. Getting that free CD, and I have the Dire Straits Brothers in Arms CD. I have that one. Um, love that one still. But yeah, I, I go back. I go back to my um, my uh, CD collection once in a while. I don't just do all vinyl. I mean, I have a you know a 
crap load yeah. in my in my garage and Rubbermaid bins that I've had through the you know late eighties and nineties. So, I mean, a lot going on there for sure. But yeah, yeah, right around that time frame, my parents bought one of the first six disc changers. Well, uh, you guys, you guys are the you guys are the rich family. You probably had color TV as well. <laughs> Well, what was interesting is is that it was a it was a uh, record player Whoa. on top, and then it had the dual di- uh, the tool tape uh, dual tape decks. Yep. Then it had the six uh, disc changer, and my parents thought it was all the rage because they could take all their vinyl records right. and record and it on the tape. On the cassette. So then yeah. they did that to pretty much their whole collection, and then they threw out all their records, which I saved the majority of, which are still in my collection to this day. So. That's kind of really what got me because I, I, as a kid, I gravitated towards all the artwork. I mean, that, that's I didn't know the music, but I loved seeing these big faces or images on the front of of records. And that's, you know, my earliest memory as a kid was was seeing the, uh, you know, the artwork that you know helped me gravitate towards the music finally. Well, for me as well. I mean, my dad um, had a you know very large collection that I still have. Um, he had he, he was really he was a hobbyist. So I mean, he made homemade speakers. I wish I still had mm-hmm. them. So we had these homemade speakers which were wild. <clears throat> and he had he had a Pioneer uh, record player, and I, and I have it in my garage. And for the life of me, I can't remember the exact model. I'll get back to you because I want to do a, I actually want to do an episode on sort of our journey with um, mm. with the equipment as well, just to sort of uh, you know yeah. obviously want you on and uh, of course the gang on as well. But for me, it was you know um, old Pioneer system, an old you know Pioneer amp, homemade speakers, Pioneer um, record player with a sure um, would have been a sure uh, cartridge at the time. I think I still have it on there, and it was a great system in its day. I mean, it was. You know, I like the Pioneer stuff, and I, to this day, I still do. So, I mean, that was my journey. And then, I, of course, when you get older, or I wanted my own system. So, when I was thirteen, um, my dad bought me a full Sony uh, stereo system with the Sony speakers and the you know, with the built-in record player and the, and the, yeah. the dual cassette as well. And I thought and I had that in my bedroom. I thought that was amazing. So, yeah, I too. I remember recording all my all the my favorite Beatles songs that I had in vinyl onto cassette, and I did this. I mean, when I was sixteen, I was doing this because that was nineteen eighty nine. So I could have yeah. these cassettes while I was driving in my car, which were ones off of my records. So yeah, I love I love that system, and it was probably in, at the day it was in the day it was probably not that cheap. But I mean, you know, it probably sounds like crap. I mean, obviously, but it was it, it did the, it did the, it did the trick. That's for sure. But you know, what's interesting about that is like there's a lot of brands that get a lot of respect in the vintage world, but don't get very much respect today. Like you know, some of the companies that are still around, you know, that are making electronics, then their vintage stuff gets more respect than even their newest models do, which is kind of wild. Yeah. Um, I, I'm again, I mean, I grew up with, I mean, I guess it wasn't vintage stuff of the day, but I mean, I still have that stuff today. And I mean, it's, I mean, I, I, I've plugged it in. I still have it. It's nice. Sure. It's yeah. nice. For me, it's yeah. more sentimental. For me, it's more sentimental. That's the thing, right? Oh yeah. And that, now, you know, now, and then we were talking this at the top. I mean, now I have a full Riga, you know, um, system with B and W speakers. I mean, it's a, you know, I'm, pretty fortunate to have that and uh, I think that's a great system and um, it's kind of funny sort of my journey from starting <laughs> starting with this Sony built-in record player um, to what I have today but yeah hello from Nebraska oh, Nebraska might be cold huh probably not probably as you know not as cold as Alberta Canada they're like 40 below Fahrenheit in, in, in Celsius and Fahrenheit um, that's when it's basically the same. So when you hear 40 below Fahrenheit, that's also yeah. 40 below Celsius. Right. I mean, I, I grew up in Winnipeg, Manitoba, which is in the middle of, of Canada. It's freaking cold all the time there. So yeah, <laughs> it's nasty. <laughs> so we wanted to talk today. I know, um, a couple things I want to talk to, um, talk about, uh, a couple things. I want to talk about Atlantic 75, of course, but yeah. I also, and I also wanted to talk, um, Rhino High Fidelity here. Mm-hmm. And we'll go through some of the records. I mean, I have them all, and I will get a. Dis- I will say say to the audience disclaimer: um, the last two were promos that I received for free from Rhino. The other six prior to that, I bought with my own money, just so everyone knows. Because I was asked it a few times. I think that was asked in the last show. I, I definitely got Marquee Moon because I did the the pre announcement show, and mm-hmm. I definitely got Coleman as promos. They were sent to me prior to the announcement, so just so everyone knows. I want to make the disclaimer. Um, just, I think it's, it's, you know, just because, I mean, I want to let everyone know that, you know, um, I didn't get them. I didn't, I got them for free. Didn't have to pay here. You'll like this though. Um, did you get a chance to, are you buying the one step MoFi Joni Mitchell? No, uh-uh. 
No. Have a look. There it is. Look at that. If you can, if you notice, it's just like the Michael Jackson and Van Halen box. It's that thin box now. I think yeah. we're, I think we're done with the thick box. I think it's all. The th and that's great. I'm really happy. I'm really, I'm really happy to see that. I'd imagine it's more cost effective to manufacture that slimmer box too. I think that larger one that you know collapses together or whatever. I mean, I think that's probably a more expensive you know venture to do it that way. So I'm sure they're saving some dollars you know, doing it in that thinner box. And I think most people like the thinner boxes anyway. And I think I asked you before, you're not, you're not a big fan of the Mitchell. You're not going to look at getting the one step, the MoFi one step. I just, I can't justify it. I don't love it that much. I mean, and there's also the box set that's out there where you can basically get like, you know, several studio albums for the price of the one, one step. So, you know, I just, I have an original of blue that's, you know, satisfactory yep. for me. Yeah. Um, but you know, I'm I'm honestly shocked that it's that it's being released. I really thought that they would <laughs> rescind <laughs> the, the Joni Mitchells just because I, I don't see people buying all six of those at the you know at the rate that they would need to generate the the money. But you know, whatever. I like Court and Spark. I have the Nautilus cut of Court yeah. and Spark. I think that's just a great album. I mean, I, that is my favorite Joni Mitchell album. If I was to, you know, the Blue is okay. Um, I yeah. mean, I grew up listening to Blue as well. But I've always, I think it's, I just, I think Court and Spark. If anyone doesn't know, Cheech and Chong is on the last track of that Court and Sparks uh, album. Just so everyone knows, it's kind of funny. I I really think if they were going to release like the entire set, you know, like they did the Eagles, they're doing the Van Halen, they're doing the Joni Mitchell. It would have been nicer just to do a box set like they used to do back in the day, like the Rolling Stones set or the Beatles set or the Frank Sinatra set and just do, you know, where you basically can get all of them for hopefully somewhat of a discounted rate than if you did it per title. I think that would yeah. have been a better, you know, route to go with the with the one steps. But, you know, so I guess that's not happening, but <laughs> that's as, as as a buyer, that's what I would have preferred is just say, here you can get, own all of them. Instead of paying six at one twenty five, maybe all six for five hundred. And for me, being in Canada here, and I know my our Canadians that are watching right now, we do have a lot of them. Um, it's a big problem for us um, in terms of uh, affordability for a lot of these one steps or each care, which are great sounding albums. And I want to put that out there for everyone. These sound great. I mean, they're definitely worth the price of admission. I get all of that. But as a consumer, um, you know, for me in Canada and for my fellow Canadians. Um, which I, I did pre-order UHKR's um, Analog Productions UHKR Gaucho. It's my second favorite, uh, second favorite uh, Steely Dan album. My first favorite being Can't Buy a Thrill and third Asia. Uh, pre-ordered that, but when the smoke clears, you're looking at uh, probably you know close to three hundred dollars Canadian with with everything. So it's a it's an expensive um, decision to make. So for me, I can't buy every single one step or UHQ or obviously I'd love to, you got to be very selective. And that's why I go back to looking to see if I have the originals, which I might have, or look at some other re, you know, reissues that might be mastered by a Kevin Gray. It might be mastered by a Chris Spellman or, or a Bernie Grenman case. Even in point, the SACD, even getting the SACD. Even the SACD, which, um, I've explored and I have many SAC, SAC, SACDs as well. Um, and I just went back, I mean, speaking of Joni Mitchell Blue, I do have Blue, and it looks like a, it's a Chris Bellman cut of Blue I have. I believe it is. So, yeah, um, yeah. I probably got for 30 bucks. But, again, there, there you go. If you look at the MoFi price point, you can get at $30 a piece, you can get all of the all six of those Joni Mitchells pretty much for the cost of one one-step, one, one and a half. One and, I've, and I've heard the argument, like, you know, you get the one-step, which has the DSD step to it. Why don't you just stick with an SHC, SHD, sure. which has the DSD step to it? I get all that. I mean, yeah. um, that's fine. But yeah, I still, I mean, I still like the one-steps that I do own, and I own some of the, you know, the older ones, obviously the uh, Donald Fagan Nightfly, which is one of my go-to for my systems. I love the way it sounds. Um, in the background, you always hear sirens like every day going by. Downtown Vancouver's like that, especially when it's cold. So, I mean, yeah, that's crazy. Probably every 20 minutes where, where I am. So, it's kind of crazy. Um, you know, so for me, you know, I like, you know, I like some of the older one steps as well. Um, I do have a couple of the, fir the first two Eagles, uh, Eagles albums that came out. It was it last two years ago now? I guess it's a while back, wasn't it? And I am contemplating because, you know, going back to Van Halen, I, I think. 
Van Halen's 1984 being my, one of my favorite albums. I have the original Canadian cut, and I wish I would have looked. I, maybe someone can help me out, but I, I want to say the original original 84 cut was probably a Ludwig cut. It's probably either a Doug Sachs or Ludwig cut. We're, we're starting to find this out now more and more. If it's not Ludwig, it's probably Doug Sachs, right? And I learned a lot when Steve Hoffman came on. Um, how he really thought Doug Sachs was the man. I mean, in terms of working with him and, and sort of the quality of work that he does. And I know having conversations with Kevin Gray, he'll say the same thing. So, um, and I will say, if you guys don't have it already, um, Analog Productions, the Doors albums, like the box set, um, plus any of the 45 RPM doors are all mastered and cut by Doug Sachs. <laughs> and those sound freaking amazing. And I have them. So an interesting point with that. So when you think about SACDs, like I'm thinking like with the analog productions, if you look at like the Atlantic series, right? Those are all basically at $60 a clip because they're doing them at 45 RPM. So most of analog productions titles that they do at th the normal 33 are usually around 40. And then the, um, and then they up at the 60, if they do the 45 RPM version, the nice thing about the SACDs are they, their price point stays the same because it doesn't matter. You know, there's no, there's no difference between, you know, the 33 or 45, like with the LP to jump the price up. So you can basically get those all, all of the Atlantic series, I think are priced at like 35, I think for the SACDs. Such a great, so, such a, such a great deal. I mean, that's something more affordable for us Canadians as well. I can buy two SACDs for the price of one record or one album, right? Which is basically, two. yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, and I knew I did hear I did read a lot of good reviews. You might have seen it as well on the Mobile Fidelity uh, fan club fan page on face on Facebook that you obviously do a lot of writing for, and I'm a member and blah blah blah. Um, the Van Halen self titled SACD by MoFi is getting a lot of praise. Oh yeah, yeah, and I think there was a little bit of like a little bit of a um, call it like hysteria necessarily, but like. I think what happened with those SACDs is they basically only do X amount on the initial run. And then they basically show on their site that they're sold out. And then people go into panic mode because they're like, oh, I didn't realize it was going to sell out. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think that does happen because those SACDs always come back in stock. I mean, it's the magic MoFi closet that I always joke about where, you know, even things have been quote unquote long out of print miraculously, there's like six copies found at some point. Does so happen, yeah. yeah, but, um, you know, I'm not opposed <clears throat> to going the SACD route, especially like with the Atlantic series, going back to that for a minute, not everybody likes the idea of 45 RPM and they're not giving the option of a 33 or a 45 with that series. Most of the analog production titles that Chad does, there's the two variants, so you can at least choose. But with those, you're stuck with the 45 RPM. So I think the SACD option is, oh, really not, every, not available. Well, Phil, Phil, remember, Phil Collins, yeah. is SACD for um, his, his, his 19, which one was that? The one within the air tonight. What's that one? What's the name of that album? But that oh, one is value. Not, face value is not an SAC, is not going to be um, done in SACD, I believe. Yeah. And is that, is that a firm like for the forever? I mean, well, I mean, is I don't it know. Like I, well, I, it's when I, I know it's a licensing thing. And then when Chad did his video about that, I mean, it's uh, sometimes it's 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 a time thing. So some of them are, you know, you have like a certain amount of yes. time, six months to a year, maybe other deals or a certain amount of units sold. I don't know how it works. I mean, we're, that's the thing about us consumers and viewers. And we, we bitch about this and want this. But we don't know sort of knows know what the negotiations are like in the background, how this all looks and how much cash as a distributor, if you're like acoustic sounds has to put up. I mean, it's it's a it's a big thing. I mean, I, it, I, I, I get all that. If you really it, but here's the thing, if you really think about it, when that Atlantic series was announced, I was thinking this is really ambitious. I mean, this is an ambitious project to release that many titles over this amount of time at this high quality level, because I mean, all the jackets are the highest, pretty much the industry highest, you know, quality you can get with the jackets that they're doing. They're pressed yeah. either QRP, RTI, top mastering yeah. engineers, and they're releasing a, ba a batch at a time every so many weeks. So, I mean, I I'm, I'm impressed <clears throat> that they're st staying on schedule to be honest. So let's talk about that. So a couple of some of the releases of the Atlantic 45 that are coming out or like 45, 75 on 45 <laughs> RP. I always do that. So uh, some stuff that interests me, we've got Matchbox 20, yourself or someone like you at 45 RPM. That's scheduled to arrive February the 2nd. So that's coming up pretty quickly. Uh, Crosby, Stills and Nash 
self-titled February 2nd as well, 45 RPM. Uh, David Crosby, could only if I can only remember my name, that's also due February the 2nd. We know MoFi's done it. Um, you get a plangent process of it as well. So again, 45 RPM. Um, that was a well-recorded album and well-engineered album as well. So I, I can't imagine that. That's sounding amazing. Uh, we also have John Coltrane, My Favorite Things at 45 RPM. That's scheduled to arrive March the 1st for the, at the Atlantic 75 series. Um, Genesis Nursery Crime, that's April the 5th. We have Foxtrot from Genesis, April the 5th. And then pretty much after that, there's Bad Company, there's Ray Charles, there's, Ming, there's Mingus, um, oh yeah, and the SACD, Roberta Flack Killing Me Softly and SACD. Um, some of the stuff, I guess, they don't, they, don't have the, they don't have the scheduled arrival dates yet. I'm just looking on their website here, but to yes. be announced for a lot of it. But some of these titles I'm really excited about. Another one too, Stone Temple Pilots. Um, you know, got Foreigner Double Vision on SHCD. It hasn't been announced yet. Um, so there's some great stuff coming out. Like you said, very ambitious, but I feel like there's some really good titles that a lot of people will, will be excited about. That's for sure. Yeah. The, the, I actually went through the list. There's only seven titles that interest me in the entire series, either because I already own a version that's available because it was already released in a, you know, high quality version, or it's <clears> just <throat> music that I, that I'm not really interested in. So it basically comes down to there's three Otis Reddings records that are coming out. Uh, the Soul Album, Doc yeah. the Bay, and Complete and Unbelievable. Those three are must-haves for me. Uh, the Wilson Pickett, exciting uh, Wilson Pickett. That's his first record uh, uh, recorded in Muscle Shoals. And then the three Ray Charles, uh, What I'd Say, The Great Ray Charles, and Genius After Hours, which it, uh, MoFi did um, that one. Yeah. But those are, the seven, those are the seven titles that I identified <laughs> as you know, on my list. And again, it's it's not that they're not picking you know good titles. Just some of them have already been done or redone, you know, several times, and I already have them. And here's the thing: we learned that. I mean, last week we learned that Rhino's you know going to be releasing American Beauty, right? I mean, stuff that a lot of people might have. But we also learned too: not everyone has American Beauty, or not everyone has like the you know the the Bellman cut, or you know. Or, or, or whatnot. So getting something reissued isn't a bad thing because not everyone has that album. So it's good that it's out there. So I, don't, I think it's a real positive thing uh, what's coming out for me. Um, in excess kick. I mean, I'm a huge in excess fan. I mean, oh, yeah. I've concert a bunch of times. That one's going to be released. I have the Abbey Road Miles Shoal 45 RPM. I've got the original. Um, I can't remember what I, I've, I got three or four different copies of it. So I'm excited and I definitely will be getting the in excess kick album. Why wouldn't I? I mean, I have to. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because on one side, you have people complaining that, you know, Rhino's, Rhino isn't releasing, you know, these major mainstream titles. They're picking a lot of these kind of off the beaten path titles. But then at the same time, they say, well, this one's already been done to death. This one's already been done to death. So I actually respect the titles that Rhino is choosing. I think they're choosing a, a mixture of very popular and then they're also sprinkling in some ones that are a little bit more you know unique and they're also kind of mixing in the jazz title so i, I personally think that they're making a, a good selections um and kind of you know keeping things um interesting i guess so let's change it up. let's we'll go back to atlantic right away but i mean going yeah. back to i know high fidelity i mean the news obviously you know we we learned that you know we've got marquee moon television um I like it. I thought it sounded great. I thought Kevin did a great job mastering it. Um, there's obviously debate out there. And then of course, uh, you know, I think that was a great rock album. That's not everyone has, it's not been re reissued a million times and, uh, apparently it's, it's selling quite well. So, I mean, I, I enjoy my copy again. I have a promo copy they got from Rhino, but uh, that being said, I mean, I did compare it to a 1977 Canadian original. Um, and I mean, I felt that, you know, if you want a little bit more bass and Kevin's uh, Rhino version has that, and I definitely feel is a little bit more in the mids as well. Um, yeah. We do know learning from Patrick Milligan at Rhino High Fidelity, they try to find um, stuff out there that the tapes aren't too in, in good shape, obviously, which really helps. And then also too, like in today's mastering engineers, the equipment is top notch that they're working on. And I think we're, we as consumers, I think this is the best time. I think we're getting a little bit spoiled with all with this clarity of vinyl and this, you know, this, um, 
um, what's the Neotech vinyl from from uh, Mobile Fidelity or RTI? I mean, I think we're getting swell because that really helps the clarity and the sound of these records as well. Having that quality vinyl definitely does. Yeah. So that so that opens up a little bit of a can of worms. So I'd be curious to get your thoughts on this. Okay. Uh oh. Uh oh. A can of worms? <laughs> not not controversy on this show. Don't do that to me. <laughs> So I'll use a comparison using movies as a as a as a illustration here. So when Blu-ray came along, okay. So one of the advantages of Blu-ray is it's the first time that we we're able to get true high definition over DVD. DVD was limited; it was never high definition. It was obviously an improvement over VHS, but Blu-ray was true high definition, 1080p or higher. Um, obviously, now we have e even the Ultra HD with 4K resolution, etc. Right. One of the things that came along with that is digital noise reduction. So yep. what they were doing was they were taking a, especially older films that had a lot of grain structure, movies that were actually shot on true film. And whenever they were releasing them to Blu-ray, because of the higher resolution, they were, they were putting all the um, filtering on to basically right. eliminate grain structure. So it looked like it was this pristine movie that was just made yesterday, as opposed to, you know, 1940s or something like that right so i feel like it's similar in the audio world right so something like the marquee moon kevin gray comes in to cut it how much of it is his responsibility to take what's originally there and finesse it to make it a quote-unquote audiophile pressing when that record probably was never intended to be as such right sure it's right. meant to sound okay but a lot of times the guitars are raw these rock records have a lot of you know um uh, compression or there's a lot of you know especially if there's a lot of instruments in the mix how much of it is really the mastering engineer's job to take what's there to bring that to market in a way that is audiophile acceptable right but then at the same time on the flip side of that is who's who is also who is also answering to that like who is essentially quality control over that process we know that chad a B compares, you know, original pressings to what they're releasing. Um, other companies might have a head that, that's kind of doing that, but in some cases, like with the Rhino series, I don't know if there's anybody that's essentially saying, yep. "Let's make it sound this particular way," or mm -hmm. how much, how faithful, how faithful do we try to stick with the, you know, original sound that's there? Um, so that's kind of the conundrum well, I, I mean feel. With that. But I mean, with Marquee Moon, it's not like it's a remix. It's basically off the master tapes, and Kevin does his. I always, you know, does his secret sauce thing, and we all know Kevin does a great job and continues to do a great job. So I mean, um, you know, what I heard from mine compared to my original, um, I I liked it a little bit better. I definitely did. Again, um, I did get a promo copy, but I'm just saying, and you know, of course, I'm good friends with Kevin Gray. But I did like it a little bit better. And right. if anyone doesn't have that album and it's expensive to go get an original, why wouldn't you spend forty bucks to buy this one? I mean, yeah, right. it's. I mean, I mean, is it an audiophile band per se? I mean, you can argue that you know, you can argue that um, the Grateful Dead isn't either. But you see a lot of audiophile pressings of the Grateful Dead for the different companies. So I mean, really, it's something fresh. The tapes are in good condition. Kevin sprinkled his his magic on it, and um, I think it's I think it's a really good pick. I really do. And yes, Rhino yeah. Hi-Fi Hi -Fi is all pressed at Optimal in Germany. No, but but even like just take, just take something just as simple as low end, right? So if Kevin's cut has more bass to it, right? yep. which it the does in some, in some tracks, it does or compared to the original right. and the original doesn't have that. Who is to say who's making that decision to say, well, this is this is actually what it should be more like or this is a better, you know, because then it becomes more of a preference thing. Some people don't like more bass in, in the mix. Some people do. And some and oftentimes it just depends on whether it's done well or not well at all. But you know, that's that's kind of what I'm saying is like, who's the authority that's making those decisions in cases like the Rhino series when. Well, I know um, Rhino, Rhino's got a big team of people. So, I mean, it's not just, you know, I'm sure they've got obviously Mr. Milligan and his team. So they all get test pressings that Kevin would send them and right. would make make decisions based on those test pressings would be my assumption. Sure. So I know, is there a lot? I haven't. I know there's. I mean, there's some people talking about Marquee Moon. There's some some reviews on it. I haven't been able to read anything today yet. But uh, again, I like my copy. Um, what's saying here? Kevin admitted he didn't know Marquee Moon prior to the mastering. 
um, but must go from uh, go for most of what he works on. There's no way he can know each album release, but his instincts are part of his job. Yeah, I believe I think that's absolutely right. As a master engineer, I mean, how much time? Just like all of us, how much time do we have to listen to this stuff when you've got family and work, and you're working eight hours a day, you're traveling, commuting, doing this? I mean, honestly, unless you're retired, you have nothing to do, no nothing but time to basically listen and spin these records like myself i mean you know it's tough as with you know with a young family to have all this time to do it so yeah um there's i think mark yeah there's a little I bit think, of a tr trust factor there too like are we seriously going to sit there and doubt the guy that's actually listening to the original master tapes <laughs> on what the, those sound like you know and, and, like and doubt the guy that gets a lot of praise and has been getting a lot of praise from everyone out there because his stuff sounds like <laughs> uh, sounds amazing so i mean again i think music is so subjective everything is subjective going back to your gear i mean you might you know most people don't have a hundred thousand dollar systems to listen to these things on as well some people might have modest systems and a modest system could be a couple thousand dollars which is a lot of money to some people and i totally respect and appreciate that to other people have five or ten thousand dollar turntables and amps and speakers and all that stuff and i get all that so i think you know if you listen to the original you had the original sounds good i have it sounds great um a fresh copy i think you're going to get a little bit more out of it depending upon your system so i think it's all about preference i really do if you've never heard marquee moon before for 40 bucks why wouldn't you buy it yeah, and I think I think the other um, sort of X factor here, and this is something that I, I don't think everybody realizes on the show on the show sometimes, is not everybody out there is looking for the best version. They're just looking for a version that's decent enough to listen to, and a lot of these titles are titles that, to me, like a lot of us weren't even born when a lot of this music was even coming out. So to, to, to gain a new audience, right. To gain like a new audience. And I've talked about, these... I talk about that all the time about gaining the audience, gaining a new audience. Cause you know, in right. the next five or 10 years, there's going to, you're going to have, have to be a new audience. Cause you know, it's yeah. <laughs> the demographic oh, really? changes. Deadheads that were following the Grateful Dead in the seventies are all dead. Yeah. Right. So we need that new audience to keep the music alive. I agree. Yeah. And then, oh, here's the NXS kick was a digital recording. There you go. Hey, Dave. I didn't know, I didn't know that. <laughs> here's, Le here's Leland. What's Leland got to say here? Um, I think a lot of these record companies need to do a better job seeing what the people want. Better focus groups are getting in, in, info from bigger people in the VC. Well, I mean, channels like this one, I know I talk to a lot of people in the industry. We give a lot of, um, you know, a lot of, uh, ideas as well so they're definitely listening that's one thing about the I, I feel in the music industry or for albums you know in movies they have these focus groups they basically have these people go into the theater and say hey watch this movie and give us some feedback and that feedback changes maybe the ending or changes some of the scenes right they don't really have that when it comes to some of these reissues i mean it's obviously that's apples to oranges i get it but something of something sort of a, a focus group in that sense would help um it yeah. would probably help sales as well from these companies that's for sure sure Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the title of the show, I know, I know getting back to things and we're going to do some Rhino Hi-Fi reviews. I mean, I, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the Rhino Hi-Fi series, getting back to the fact that, it, you know, they're picking some titles, that are not just, you know, not just overdone. I know the Doobie Brothers, um, Doobie Brothers got a lot of flack as well, but this is a great sounding record, guys. I mean, <laughs> the captain and me is a great sounding audio fi file quality record. So, I mean, you can't complain about that. I, I have the Nautilus version of that as well. The Nautilus is like a half speed master. And I felt it was a little bit softer compared to, compared to the, uh, the hi-fi series. Um, maybe, maybe bringing back what, what it should have sounded like more on the tape on, on this cut than my Nautilus. Hard to say mm -hmm. though. Yeah. Um, and then some of the jazz titles, as you can see here, what do you think, and you were mentioning before, you like the jazz titles that they've put out so far? I mean, uh, you, like, yeah. you, you like those? Yeah, I, well, I also like and, the and, fact... And, and Herbie Hancock Crossings, by the way, is just a phenomenal album, just so everyone knows. I, I have the uh, Speaker's Corner version of that one. Okay, yeah. But um, the one thing that I do like is, because they mentioned on your uh, show that they were originally thinking about doing Candio along with the debut cars album as a, as a release at the same time, which would have been fine. But I actually like the fact that they're kind of keeping like a rock with a jazz or, <clears throat> you know, an R and B with a, you know, pop, you know, I think it's nice to kind of keep, you know, mixing the genres out there and kind of keeping the diversity with the releases. I think that's, 
I think that's kind of cool. Um, hopefully everybody has a flavor each month or two that, that appeals to them. And, um, and again, this, like this series isn't meant to be like, I mean, they're only doing like what 5,000 of most, most of the titles. 5, 000, yeah. 5,000. And if there's any bigger demand, they could basically press more without the number on it. So, I mean, yeah. you know, so far, I mean, what do they have so far? Let's just go back here. Um, I mentioned Herbie Hancock. They got, they've got, uh, the crossings I mentioned the Doobie brothers, the captain and me, um, We've got Coleman, uh, Change of the Century, which is another great sounding album. Um, if you like avant-garde sort of jazz or <laughs> free, range, free range jazz. I know uh, Patrick Peavithall doesn't, but I mean, that's okay. And then of course, this is the big one, the, the Cars um, self-titled, yeah. incredible. And then uh, really under, you know, this one here, uh, which is one called Word of Mouth by, Pister is it Pisterius? Jacko Pisterius. Yeah. Um, Great album. It's not something not something I'm familiar with. I mean, this is a. I think this came out originally in 1982, 1983. So I mean, it's not something that I grew up with or listened to. But when I got a copy, which again I bought myself, I was quite impressed with it. Um, yeah. And then another one here. I know Rhino's done it a few times, but this is the Van Morrison, his band in the Street Choir. Great album. Yeah. So I mean, if you put all those together in a pod, I think that's a pretty eclectic mixture of titles. I mean, I, I think it is. And most of these have not been done to death so i think that's great um i know the car's debut sold out pretty quickly uh, yeah. you know and i mean that would be a title to definitely do a, a you know a, maybe another pressing of i i asked them that i asked patrick milligan that i don't i don't know i guess they might i don't know well i i don't think he said anything i don't think he said they were going to i think it just depends on demand at this point I just think that that's a title that everybody should have in their collection at some point. So I feel like it should be in print. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but having um, candy, having candy will come out in March will be really fun too. I mean, that's such a great album. And well, and then the other thing too, is finding a clean original of that debut album, it, it's going to run you about 20, 25 bucks. So to be able to get that reissue for what is that? 39, 99, 40 bucks or whatever. Yep, I mean, that's, exactly. that's not, that's not too far of a stretch. So <clears throat> yeah, uh, I like to see. I mean, in terms of Van Morrison albums, I think should be re remastered and cut by uh, um, Rhino High Fidel. The Vidon Fleece into the music or Wavelength are the three. Those are huge. Yeah. I mean, that would be amazing. We already found out that Moon Dance, the tapes are not um, good enough to basically use any longer, so they can't use Moon Dance. And that's yeah. the thing about High Fid uh, Rhino Hi Fi. They're only going from the master tapes, um, analog master tapes. That is. So for, for now, I mean, eventually if they do like a night fly, obviously that's a digital master tape, but yeah. There, I think there's a bigger, bigger market out there for Van Morrison than maybe most people might realize. <laughs> I mean, you know, and I think most of his records were, were recorded pretty well. So they sound great. Um, so I think that that co combined with just the fact that, you know, there's a lot of either closeted or uncloseted listeners of Van Morrison out there. So I think there'll be a lot of, I think going back to Candy O, um, is Jeffrey Larson here. Um, he's got a near mint, uh, Candy O can't wait to compare it to the Rhino. He loves the self titled. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, self titled too. I mean, every track is a hit, you know, it's been, it was on the radar. I remember, you know, growing up with, you know, hearing all those are like big FM tracks. I mean, I knew every single yeah. song, even be, you know, even before I dropped, dropped the needle on that. It's kind of funny. Yeah. Uh, so, what's, do, what's this here? There you go. Ted Templeman is production. Yeah, absolutely. Ted was, did some great productions. Um, did he do a lot of the Van Morrison productions or just a few of the albums? I want, if anyone knows, I'd be curious to know. Sorry, you're going to say something. Oh, I, I didn't know. If I didn't know if that was a good lead in for my uh, uh, Ray Charles yeah, Atlantic let's, series. I, I want to talk about the Atlantic series. I know you did a good review on it here. Um, you haven't posted anything on, on any of the sites yet, have you, with this review? Is this an exclusive exclusive Atlantic 75 Nathan Goss review? I, Co I, Cosplay I, I, Mazzy? I, I, did, I, did, I did post it out on the Analog Productions uh, page, but okay. I, didn't, I didn't do it anywhere else. And I have to yeah. apologize. I have not read it, so go for yeah. it. Let's let's hear yeah. let's hear about it. Okay, so I I have not picked up. This is my this is my first venture into the Atlantic series. Okay, so they just haven't released anything to date that you know really struck my fancy too much. Um, so this is Ray Charles' debut album. Uh, although by the time that this came out in 1957, he had already had. A ton of hits. Uh, there's actually 11 hits off of this record alone. 
this record later uh, was released, I think a few years later, under the title Hallelujah, I Love Her So, which is one of the tracks on there. Um, so I was really excited to get this because it has a lot of my favorite you know, tracks on here. Um, but outside of just the phenomenal packaging, I was a little disappointed, to be honest, with the uh, with uh, the LP. So I'll just kind of give a quick summary here. But it didn't sound right to me. Um, something just does not sound right about this release. Um, I actually went back and listened to a lot of original pressings that I have from Ray Charles from the 50s and 60s. Um, and this just doesn't sound, just doesn't have that, um, it just doesn't leap out uh, quite like I expected it to. And there's a lot of bass and it's not good bass. It's like very bloated, distorted, just disruptive kind of bass. Um, and I think by being on this 45 RPM, I think the bass is even more prominent and it actually kind of distracted from the listening experience um i didn't make any tweaks or adjustments with the eqing to try to offset that i don't feel like that's my job to try to <laughs> make it sound better um so with more volume because that's the other thing is whenever i started playing it the volume was definitely lower than most 45 rpm cuts that i listened to so i had to boost up the volume and obviously with more volume came more bass which started to drown out um a lot of the experience um, so I was really disappointed because this was, was a title that I was really looking forward to as my first venture into the series. Um, so I have some suspicions on maybe, you know, what the problems are with this. I would say the first is we don't know what the condition of the master tapes are at this point. So it could be the condition of those combined with doing it as a 45 RPM where you do get a lot of that low end presence and maybe it just wasn't accommodated for in the uh, mastering um, i'm not actually sure who mastered this i couldn't find out so if anybody knows who actually did the mastering on this i'd be curious um, does it not does it not say in the dead wax would you say it probably does you should look in the dead wax i'll take a look um but yeah so i just you know so i'm a little cautious on the next three uh, ray charles titles coming out but I'll probably get them anyway. So it just wasn't, it just doesn't sound right to me. And I'd be curious if anyone else felt the same. So that was kind of the gist of it whenever I posted it out on um, the Analog Productions page to see if anyone else. Okay, Rick's Fee Spinner. Brunman. We all know Bernie does some great stuff. I mean. Wait, hang I, on. No. Oh, well, maybe. And the thing is, too, I, I these master engineers do great stuff. So, I mean, it's probably, if you're hearing that, it's probably a master tape thing. Because, I mean, these guys know their stuff. I'm not going to sit here and say, I know better than Bernie Grenman or Kevin Gray or Chris oh, Feldman. Right. I clearly don't. And I don't think no one's going to say that today. And I, I'll i be the first to say it because that would be asinine and egotistical to say that. But, again, you're looking for a certain listening experience, right, compared to your originals. Is that what you're comparing it to from what I'm hearing. Yeah, so that, that, and that kind of goes back to my point earlier is sometimes polishing things too much. Like, you know, for example, I have, this is the sensational Ray Charles. I have great, great album, by the way, the great Ray Charles, yeah. um, soul feeling. I have, uh, the two country volumes, right. And when you listen to these, even though they're not as clean, they don't have that pristine sound as a, as a, as a new reissue often does. Um, there's definitely that dynamic range where the music just leaps out and just has that fidelity to it that you become accustomed to, especially the material Ray Charles was doing in the 50, 50s and 60s, where that the vocal presence is just like cutting through that mix. Uh, and these are all mono, right? So it's like it, you get like that stacked sound where it's like vocals and then piano and then band and just everything is just kind of stacked in that mix. And so... Um, I just wasn't hearing it with the with the Atlantic reissue series. I'm just kind of curious if any if anyone else. And I can't I can't make out what the Deadwax says here. So if anyone knows, um, maybe Dave, David from Safe and Sound might know. Um, but yeah, and Hoffman did master Best of Ray Charles. I believe they were a remix though, not just a master. He remixed uh, the Ray Charles yeah. as well. Someone just put that up there, just so everyone knows. Okay. Yeah. yeah. 
So it just doesn't have that signature sound that I guess I was, you know, kind of hoping for. And um, so, but anyway, it, it's not going to stop me from grabbing the other titles, but I just have a little bit more caution, I guess you might say. So Charlie White saying this, Nathan, it may not be your job, but it's your choice as a listener. If it's too bassy, turn down the bass tone control. Apparently not all 75 releases are perfect. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, I mean, even disengaging subs or whatever. I mean, I, I agree, but I'm just trying to give my viewpoint on what I was hearing just off the cuff, right, without making any tweaks. And they're definitely not here to bash any of the albums, any of the engineers or anything like that. I mean, it's just something that you're hearing. And, um, yeah. you know, I know we they all do a great job, that's for sure. Um, yeah. Bad, I heard a lot of, you know, this bad company, the Atlantic 75, I don't own it. But, I mean, I'd like to hear someone's opinion on that if they want to put that in the comments. I mean, that's a, that, there's a few albums that I, I definitely want to pick up at some point. I'm not doing the whole FOMO rushing thing. Again, I just laid out $300 for Gaucho Canadian. That should be, yeah. I, I think that's coming out. Hopefully, I haven't heard uh, the date in that one, but hopefully that's soon. I'm mean, really excited about the UHK or Gaucho. Now, the jacket on this thing. Is yeah, I was going to say, let, let's go to that. I want to see this whole thing. This looks amazing. I mean, the jacket is just, I mean, this is as glossy as it gets. I mean, it's sturdy. I mean, the packaging is is phenomenal. So, I mean, and that's why I'm sure most people are excited about the titles that they, that they did get, you know, whether it's the Genesis or whether it's the Phil Collins. I mean, when it comes in a package like this and it sounds great, I mean, you got to be happy about that. So, and these are pretty much on par or whatever with the UHQR packaging uh, once you actually get into the box. So. What's the, yeah. uh, are you opening it? There's a gatefold. Let's see that whole thing. Oh, the gatefold? Yeah. Yeah, let, let me take the. Uh, I was waiting for you to show me that. I didn't know you were putting it all away. Let me see. Very nice. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Amazing. And what a, what a great, what a great uh, artist <laughs> to talk about on uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day here. Uh, just. I mean, Ray Charles, in my opinion, is one of the most important figures in in bridging the gap between white and black audiences in the 1950s and 1960s. And just about any artist that was making any music after that point in time, especially in the rock and pop genre, you know, credits him as right. as a major influence. So, but yeah. <laughs> So you've obviously been a listener of Ray Charles for a number of years. So you sort of knew, knew what you're listening oh, yeah. to before you went into it. Oh yeah, that, that's my that's probably my favorite album. I mean, okay. so you know, I've heard it a gajillion times, but just didn't quite hit the mark for me personally. But I'm not saying it's bottom of the barrel. It's just uh, you know, it just wasn't up there with what I was anticipating in my mind. So. Uh, Brian asked, Steve, aren't all the UHK or Steely Dan titles coming to regular black QRP pressings? Why not just wait on the same master for $220 less? So I want the best. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, when it, and that's kind of the thing. When it's like one of your all-time favorites or one of your favorites, you know, you do in those cases leap for the, you know, yeah. best version on the market, hopefully, right? Yeah. And then there's some titles that you don't necessarily need the best. And that's kind of what I was saying earlier with like the Joni Mitchell. It's not that I hate Joni Mitchell, but I don't need the best version of blue. You better not. She's Canadian by the way. So just saying. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. And a huge, and a huge influence, obviously of Crosby stills um, and Nash, of course. I mean, just, you know, huge influence yeah. in a lot of, a lot of people in music. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, so kind of a weird segue here I was I was hoping to get into is so yeah. we we're talking about CDs earlier right and so one of the when I was in like middle school one of the uh, CD series that I had was called classical music for people who hate classical music I love it and already. so and so I with that kind of mindset I was thinking what would I do if I were to make like a jazz for people who hate jazz music, right? And that brought me to, <laughs> that brought me to uh, the Prestige series. So in 2023, I finally completed uh, all 50 titles from the Prestige series. So hold on, hold on, hold on. You have yeah. all 50. I finally got all 50. Yeah. Incre so congratulations. That's a that's amazing. 25 stereo and then yep. the 25 mono. Right. So put it right up. I just want the, the folks to see everything there. 
if you can yeah. put it up. Yeah, thank you. So, and these were released several years ago and then they went out of print and then Chad repressed them. And ever since then, they're kind of hit or miss. Sometimes they're available, sometimes they're uh, restocked, whatever the case may be. So I finally, finally got all of them. So what I decided to do is put together if I were to re if I were to rebuy that collection, what would be the first five that I would get from the mono, and then the first five that I would get from the stereo? So are you ready for them? Oh my god, I'm I'm excited. Go. <laughs> so we'll start in mono. All right. Okay. So if we're going mono, uh, the first one would be steaming with Miles Davis. So th this is just like this is such a fun record. Um, of course, Miles Davis has to be on the list, right? And with Miles Davis, you got to have John Coltrane. So Soul Train would also be on the list. So these two would be my first first two from from the Mono series. Then here's one that I would pick just because it has a good sampling of different people. So Donald Byrd, Hank Mobley, John Coltrane, Paul Chambers, and Philly Joe Jones. This is the informal jazz, so just a nice sampling. Very nice. So, so I would pick up that. All of these. And how much are they right now? Just so the folks know. Forty a piece. And here's the other thing. All of, all of these sound fantastic. So what I did is I picked the ones that I thought sounded the best, but also the best content. So like that perfect intersection of great music and great mm. quality. And then my man, Sonny Rollins. Nice. Love it. So saxophone Colossus has to be on there. The, so Sonny Rollins was my entryway into jazz. I, I've talked about that a little bit. Um, this is like Casablanca of of jazz. So like the, I mean, this is like the must have in 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 a collection. And then the last one from the Mono series would be Bags Groove. I just think this is such a fun fun record. A lot of great players on here. Um, sounds extremely good. <laughs> yeah, jazz for people who are jazz. Yes. So All right. I think that this is a new feature then. I think it's, you know, I think we should start this. And Nathan Goss, jazz for people that hate jazz. These are the ones that you need to buy and have in your collection if you hate jazz or don't yeah. like jazz because this will get you, this will get you converted. Well, even if it doesn't get you converted, it, it at least like opens up your ears and your mind to like hearing different things, different sounds. It, and like not everybody wants to go out and, and have, you know, a thousand titles from, these artists right but if you want to have just a few and i like this prestige series because it's not all like obvious choices like there's a lot in here that's like kind of more under the radar right okay so let's get on to the stereotypes. so absolutely first on my list would be the jane ammons nathan the ray charles 245 rpm was mastered by bernie Brown. okay that's what i thought i saw all right this would this right here. This this is the soulful moods of Gene Ammons. This is like the perfect evening listening. It, when you're winding down, th th it doesn't get much better than this. This is actually probably my favorite recorded sax sound on any record. It's got like this perfect natural reverb to it. It just sounds like mm. it, it's like I, I it's it's bliss. This is like the perfect record for that situation. Okay. Number two would be Benny Golson's Groovin' with Golson. This was a surprise because I wasn't familiar with, with this record. Uh, Benny Golson's still alive and kicking at 95 years old. Uh, but this record from 1959, which is probably like one of the greatest years in, in jazz, uh, in, in music, 1959. But this album kicks butt. So this would be like number two on my pick. I'm trying to do it so it doesn't get the glare. All right. I talk about this one all the time, the bluesy Burrell. So any uh, Kenny Burrell albums worth getting twice. Uh, this one with Coleman Hawkins. This sounds absolutely amazing. Also in that sort of like evening wind down sort of thing, like if you like uh, Bill Evans and if you like um, the Chet Baker, uh, like Chet Baker in New York, Kenny Dorham's Quiet Kenny is a must have, in my opinion. I want to I... say that they're... I think they're doing this on the Atlantic series, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. I remember that Kenny Dora and Quiet Kenny came out for a record store day, and that was a big hit as well. And that that was major FOMO of about a year or two ago. There's a yeah. record store day cut of that one as well. And the last one, and this one, Chad uh, Kasim always talks about, is his like favorite record. But yeah, 
if you're going to own one blues record, you know, going away, Lightning Hopkins. I mean, this I, one, I own it. Yeah. So really what it comes down to is like these minimalist blues albums where there's only like a few instruments. And I mean, they're just raw. They're organic. Um, you know, for people that are just kind of delving into like that, you know, slow blues, uh, muddy waters. You know, I mean, that 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 record does sound spectacular. And so that would be on the list as well. So those would be the 10. If you just want to get only 10, that you can't go wrong with any any of those. So that's that would, those would be my choices. So that's our that's our new segment for jazz picks for people that hate jazz. There it is. There we go. There we go. I, I can basically now can the, the, the Nathan vinyl vents. So we can do this instead, or this is just a yeah. You know what? I, you know, <laughs> as much as I like hearing other people rant, I, I, I think in twenty twenty four, I'd like to keep things more on a positive note. It's like too depressing listening to everybody just you know complain about <laughs> you know everything. And I, well, I agree, let, there's things that are let annoying, me, but let me stop you there. And that's the thing. I think we're in great times. We've got, you know, QRP is a, you know, presses some great vinyl. RTI does optimal does. There's some great plants out there. They're, you know, producing quality. Then you have the master engineers with some of the best equipment you can possibly have right now using, you know, that equipment to basically master and cut, you know, master tapes from 50, 60 years ago. I think we're really fortunate right now to be music lovers and enthusiasts. And I know, um, you know, our audio file, I mean, no one's ever going to, you cannot make everyone happy. We all get that. I understand all that, but just look at the amount of, um, reissues that are coming out from all the different companies We're we should feel very fortunate. I mean, you don't have to buy every single one. Absolutely not. And you know, Will everyone sound what the way you want them to sound? No, because music is subjective based on, and I keep saying this, based on your mood, based on your equipment, based on, you know, based on a lot of different variables out there. So one person might love the sound of your Kenny Burrell. Some other might like their original better. I mean, right. you know, you, if you put a hundred people in a room, you're going to probably get a hundred different answers anyways. So it's, yeah. that's the thing about music. That's the great thing about what we do and what we're we're talking about here it's subjective but fun and i mean um i i just feel i mean this is the time i mean with the atlantic 75 series and rhino series and mofi all that stuff is coming out there's some great stuff right now that's out there i mean fine it might be 50 years old or whatever but that's the market that's the demographic but i'm i i think we're in a really good time in terms of the reissue market yeah and, and that's and, and that's not a that's not a rant. Is that a rant? I don't know if that's a rant. No, I mean clean originals are fine. Not everybody has access to get them, and even online, like some of the stuff in that prestige series, if you were to find clean originals, you're going to pay four hundred, five hundred, six hundred dollars for some of those titles. They're not the ones that are more readily available, or or more copies are out there. So that's kind of the other thing to take into consideration is is that you also have to look at availability and the cost factor whenever it comes to you know a lot of the titles. And that goes back to my Marquee Moon example as well. I mean, original is expensive. So, I mean, buying a $40, you know, basically reissue, remastered by Kevin Gray, all, you know, all analog, press it optimal, an incredible, incredible display in terms of the uh, the gatefold vinyl, and every, uh, gatefold um, album jacket and everything. And, of course, the vinyls. <laughs> It's it's a really good value of what we're getting right now. I mean, we cannot yeah. complain. We can't complain about this stuff. We really can't. And and, there, and there's more people interested now than ever before, which means more people are grabbing up a lot of those titles, right? So, I mean, I, I think we always have to be mindful of of bringing to market. I, I think we want like in print, like the best stuff that's out there. And so uh, that means, yeah. you know, reissue or whatever. I want to just jazz bums Chris here. Mood is super important for sure. I've listened to certain records and not and not really dug them and then listened to them a week later and thought they were amazing. I always give sometimes you know, something multiple shots. Not even that. If you're going to review a record, not just multiple shots, maybe on multiple different days and go back mm -hmm. to your listening notes on multiple different days and say, hey, oh, wow. Because maybe you're in a bad mood. Maybe someone pissed you off at work or you got in an argument with your significant other. Your kids are driving you crazy for the day. It doesn't have the same effect. I mean, you know, maybe you like a glass of wine. Uh, that might help. I mean, there's so many variables involved that I don't think one person out there in YouTube land can basically say definitively this is the best or that is the best. It depends on the person and that day and their equipment. That's for sure. And there, yeah. apparently I nailed it. Thank you.
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense though. But I mean, I, I'm really excited for this year. And I mean, um, we'll go a little bit of overtime because we didn't get into a couple of things. I mean, in terms of, of gear and, and the journey there, are you, are you planning on sort of sitting, you know, stepping back a little bit and maybe listening to some of the stuff that you've purchased? Cause I mean, I've got a crap load. I spent a lot of money in the last couple of years and on a lot of reissues and I haven't had the time yet to be honest with you, really appreciate what I have. And I think most of us need to sort of step back for a second and say, whoa, look what we have. Look at our collection. I mean, yeah. it's pretty awesome what we have. Pretty awesome what's happening. If you look at the analog, the Acoustic Sounds website or the MoFi website or the Rhino website, there's some awesome stuff happening no matter what. Yeah, and I and I think the fact that right now um, things are not you know flying off the shelf as fast as they were two, three years ago. So I think we're able to make more educated you know, buying decisions right now, because we know that it's still going to be available for several weeks or months or even forever. <laughs> it's not something that we have to, you know, have the credit card already entered in and ready to hit, you know. Do you remember, do you remember those days? I remember those days with, it was craft recordings when they had their, their, um, was it small their batch. Ones, the small batch. And I would be like, okay, you got the special code. I'd be texting you and a couple other guys. Okay. Did you get your special code? Okay. And it'd be like yes. a Saturday at 9am, get on the website. Boom. You got your special code and, and get the album. I mean, those were the days, weren't they? Yeah. Um, and I think they were doing like 300 copies, which it's like, why even bother doing just 300, you know, like it just, just didn't make sense. So, yeah. So Andy's music data says Marquee Moon original has gone up and it has gone up a lot in the last five years. Is it a good choice for a reissue? Exactly. It is not the standard classical rock audio file, but it's $40 and the tapes were in great, great uh, condition. Like we learned from Kevin and Patrick Milligan when they were on the show here. Um, why not? I think uh, it's a great thing. It's a great album to add to your collection, no matter what. Like why buy the original for $60, $70, $80 when you can get this one for $40 brand new? Yeah. Well, you, you, if, so you, if Steve, you can find it. So, so you talked about having like a lot of stuff like in the to listen to pal, right? Well, here's the other thing. Anytime you do any type of equipment upgrade, you immediately want to go through your whole repertoire of stuff again. And okay. You know, so if you do an equipment upgrade, that could basically screw up your whole way of what you listened to before. Maybe you're Ray Charles, maybe your Mark Hay Moon set sounds completely different now because you have a certain. Um, upgrade to your equipment. So this is the thing. No one can tell me uh, one thing or another. It's going to depend on your system. It's going to depend on your mood. It's going to depend on so many different things. Well, and being that you're probably the only person listening to it for the rest of your life in your space, right? Or one of the few people that would be listening to it. What does it matter what other people think of it? I had, I had, um, what did I have on the other day? We ha I put on I put on the uh, Steve Hoff and Kevin Gray rumors uh, Fleetwood Mac forty five RPM. Uh, my yeah. wife my wife was in the other room. She goes, man, that really does sound good. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. like, so I mean, you know, she's not she's into music, but not in the same way you and I or obviously all, any of us here are as well. But she listened, she was listening to that, going, wow, that sounds good. And she knows that album growing up, you know, listening to that as well, and she could really tell, like, wow, that does sound phenomenal. Yeah, when you get somebody that doesn't know much about it to like comment on it, that means that somebody did a good job. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. so we're at, we're at the top of the hour. Um, I'm wearing my Bills shirts. Every time I've worn a football shirt, the football team has won seven nothing Bills right now. I'm reading, so that's pretty good. So I haven't. Uh, I guess I'll have to go watch it later today. Uh, we're at the top of the hour. Did you want to add anything else? Did we miss anything? I hope we didn't miss anything. I don't want to disappoint anyone. I like your prestige. Um, and that's out of the Acoustic Sounds website, if anyone doesn't know as well, where you can pick a lot of those up, right? Of course, if you can't yep. get them there, Discogs as well. Um, getting back to it, so the Atlanta 75, a <clears throat> couple things here. Um, if anyone's interested, Matchbox 20, The Yourself, or Someone Like You, that was their biggest, I think their biggest selling album. That's coming out February 2nd. Uh, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, self-titled, February 2nd as well. David Crosby, if I can only remember your name. Uh, February 2nd and then March 1st. Are you interested in the, the Coleman, my favorite things? I mean, I have a, I think I have a second press Canadian copy at home um, and of giant, of giant, of uh, favorite things. Or no, I don't have the favorite things one. I have the one that Kevin Gray just cut, I think a year or two ago, if I'm not mistaken, of favorite things. It's the Coltrane I have of, of yeah. giant steps. I have a second, uh, a second pressing of that one. Yeah, I have, uh, I have a 30, you know, I, I like those at 33 RPM, so I'm not interested in the 45 RPM of those. Uh, they're doing giant steps and my favorite thing, so I'll be passing yeah. on those. Yeah. Yeah. 
But they, again, just because you're passing doesn't mean other people won't get it because not everyone has it. It depends on a lot of different variables there too. So, I mean, I think it's great that these are all coming out instead, you know, because we've seen the price of original records go up so much in value. I mean, um, I'm good friends with, you know, the record store owner just over here. He's let me do my show there before and it's now 14 nothing Buffalo. There you go. So there you go. I'm well, good the, luck with I'm good luck with these things, Nathan. The 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 mo the model with that series was actually kind of smart because they did the pre order for the entire series, right? So they already know that we have these accounted for already for this many customers. Yeah. So I think that's actually going to help them keep these on pace because they already got the funds, right? You had to pay up front for the whole series that's going to be released over three years of time. So I think that was probably the the smart route to go. Yeah. Um, because I, I really think that they reshifted the sequence in which they did the Steely Dan's based on the selling of those. I think they I think doing twenty thousand was a bit of a stretch for for those. I think they should have kept them. Probably they're they're doing they're doing thirty thousand for Asia, and then is it and then 20 the rest for are like 20. 20? Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. It'll so take some anyway. time. They'll be they'll be out for a while. That's you know again we're not in the, the we're post COVID FOMO where you know oh my god I have to buy everything. I mean we we're all guilty of that and we all you know jacked up prices because of it. But I think it's great. There's going to be inventory for years and you know I think it's good that a new generation will eventually be able to you know grab some of this stuff that's out right sure. now. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, we'll leave it at that. We'll leave it. At I got I, I got to go watch the Bills game now. So I got to. All right. Thanks for thanks for coming on um, sure. Friday, and then we'll of course um, we'll be back Friday for a Friday roundtable. So thanks everyone, much appreciated for this Monday. This is the cold Vancouver edition. It's uh, thirty degrees Fahrenheit okay. here, so I'm shivering right now. And there's no heat in this building today, by the way. So I'm wearing this T-shirt and I'm freezing. The, the, the heat somehow is not working. This building is a heritage building, like 1912. It was made, and there's no heat. My fingers are freezing right now. I can hardly like touch the screen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Take care, Nathan. It was really All nice right. to see you. This is yeah. awesome. Thank you again.